I'm Louise Nicola, and this is The Neuro Experience. I've heard uh, people also saying that they're taking a certain probiotic or a prebiotic that actually has GLP-1 in it. Is that a thing? If it was working, there will be shortage of that probiotic That's and not I mean. of semaglutide or tirsepatide. So let's talk about that because we have this huge ozempic wave, and I know that's just the GLP one, but then we've got tizepatide, which is GLP one and, and GIP. And I'm guessing there's going to be a triple threat coming, coming out next year. Oh my god! You actually described uh, this life cycle of of GLP ones like the iPhone. Yes, I they, like to. Do <laughs> at the you know at the seat of it, they all call people. They all do the same thing, but every year they're getting updated. Thing they're getting better, better, safer, less safer. side effects, more potent, more e- efficacious. Right. Okay, so let's talk about what's the difference between GLP one Ozempic and then the GLP one and GIP from Tizepatide. So GLP one, which is a maglutide, uh, it's a single. Single hormone. hormone. Tirsepatide, it's a combination of two gut hormones, GLP-1 and GIP. And the retatrutide is the triple agonist, and this is going to be GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon. So together, and they're in phase 3B, so they're oh, almost, there. almost there, yeah. um, and the results are beyond anything that we see in patients losing up to 40% body weight compared to what we see in tirsepatide, which the, the max is 24, 25% of weight loss. But what is glucagon doing extra? So glucagon itself, it uh, produces or increases the production of, of glucose in the liver, right? It's really interesting that they added this hormone and they're seeing even more significant weight loss. So really the mechanism of action in regards to more weight loss is not really known. In your book, so you, you've a doctor's guide to GLP-1 medication, sustainable weight loss and health you deserve. You also have a strong love for midlife women. And you also are prescribing uh, perimenopause, menopause. So you're doing a lot of hormone replacement therapy, yes. which I think right now that is being spotlighted. Mm-hmm. Um, the word estrogen and menopause right now, we're hearing a lot about it, which is a great thing. No longer are we we're hoping that women are no longer scared to, you know, get on this in fear of breast cancer. Let's talk about midlife and let's talk about estrogen's role in, in fat and and that mid area in that mid section where a lot of women are reporting to start gaining weight and they've got stubborn fat. What's happening there? So after the age of 40, women gain one to two pounds per year on average. Um, and we attribute that to the changes in estrogen, right? So we need estrogen. Estrogen is an anti-inflammatory hormone, number one, but also estrogen helps to maintain our body composition with lean muscle mass and maintain our body fat in our hips, in our breast that is more protective for our fertile years. And what happens in perimenopause and menopause is that fat gets uh, transport them more centrally, which start accumulating excess fat intra-abdominally. And that's the visceral fat, which is the pro-inflammatory fat, right? That's what we call the bad fat that can lead to metabolic disease, increases your risk for cancer. It's pro-inflammatory. So all of those changes while the estrogen starts to fluctuate during perimenopause can affect the body composition of women. So many times women come to my office and say, this is not the way that I used to gain weight. Yeah, it, now, now it's everything fat. in, the, in yeah. the center, right? So they, 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 they know their bodies and they recognize mm-hmm. that this is not their normal pattern or wake of waking. If a female is taking hormone replacement therapy, whether it's estrogen, progesterone, and they also want to take a GLP-1, can they? They're not contraindicated against each other? They don't replace each other right? They have different function in our body, uh, but they are options. And I always say that both HRT, menopause hormone treatment and GLP-1 should not be the last resource, right? They should be first line treatment. That's interesting. But if someone's prescribed a GLP-1, are they going to be on it for the rest of their lives? It's always what's the story of the individual patient that brought them to use or need a GLP-1, right? Every patient has a different story. So for patients that always struggle with their weight since childhood, they've had child obesity or overweight, they've been on diet most of their life, they've been in training programs, they go to camps to lose weight, most likely those patients will require long-term treatment, 
let's say a woman that never struggled with weight, pregnancy, hits midlife, they have 30, 40 pounds that they cannot lose, they'll go on a GLP-1, maybe there's a possibility that they will be able to maintain on their own once they lose the weight, if they never struggle with weight. But maybe the same woman has a very strong family history of obesity. And while she was working out in her 20s and her 30s, not with the kids, not with age, it starts gaining weight, has obesity, most likely that she will require also long-term. But I always like to flip the coin. Using a GLP-1 long-term is not a failure, is not bad. It's actually, we have to see it in a positive way. And this is the beauty of these medications. And this is the difference of using a medical treatment and going into a crazy diet that is going to make you lose 30 pounds in four months, right? Is that we actually, for the first time, have a medication that will help you maintain the weight loss. Maintain is right? the key. It's maintain the weight loss because mm-hmm. many things can take you there, but it's not maintainable. It's not sustainable. But for the first time, we can offer you something that is also going to help you stay at your goal. Mm. How do you feel when people come to you and say, and this is talking like a social media uh, p- uh, perspective, when they say you shouldn't get GLP-1s, you can just, you know, what about willpower? Yeah, I think it's very, very easy to assume when you see somebody with obesity that they have not tried to lose weight, Mm. that they have not done the legwork, that they've not seen doctors, nutritionists, trainers. They probably can give this person a cathedra in weight loss and diet and nutrition, right? I haven't met a single patient and I have thousands of patients through the years that came to me and said, I do nothing about my weight. I have obesity, but I'm sitting in my couch all day. I don't think about it. I'm not trying. And this is one of the reasons that I wrote my book because it was so, so eye-opening hearing story after story of my patients doing everything that we were recommending them. They were eating less. They were counting carbs. They were counting grams of fat. They were working out, cardio, spinning, you name it. They were doing everything, but it was just not working. So we know now that weight gain, obesity, is not a willpower. Mm -hmm. So having more willpower is not going to make the person lose weight. It's a multifactorial disease. We have hereditary genetics, right? And that accounts to 50 to 70% of the recent somebody's going to have obesity or be overweight, Mm -hmm. right? We know the parents' weight preconception, both mother and father, is going to impact their offspring's weight in the future. Hold on. Yeah. The weight you are when you are pregnant Mm -hmm. can directly affect your unborn child and how they're going to live their life. It's already increasing the risk for obesity even (gasps) before conception if you start with obesity. And this is for both Partners. So always my counseling for my fertile age patients that are thinking pregnancy, I always explain to them, look, this is the best for the future of your baby, the f- best for less complications during pregnancy, and even to improve your chances of fertility, right? Is starting conception at a healthy weight. Now, we have obesity that can be transgenerational, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I always do a very thorough family history on my patients. So I go two, three generations above the patient and you always see a pattern of obesity. Mm -hmm. So I I put to my patients in the table, I said, you have the possibility, your grandparents, your great-grandparents didn't know, your grandparents didn't know, your parents didn't know that their weight affected your future weight, but you know. So you can break that transgenerational hereditary of obesity. Oh my goodness, that is huge because then they stop passing it on. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, to me, it sounds like a miracle drug, right? But what type of scientist would I be if I didn't look at uh, both sides of the coin? Now, when I uh, when I put this out on social media, I get so many comments, and we're going to go through through them, and maybe we can myth bust now. Mm-hmm. I've been told that taking a GLP one can increase your risk of getting certain types of thyroid cancer. Is this true? That is not true. Why is this a thing? So in uh the studies in the laboratory, it was found that some mice, there was a higher occurrence of medullary thyroid carcinoma, which is a very specific a very aggressive, and aggressive yeah. thyroid cancer, right? 
Um, it was never reproduced in humans. It has not been reported in humans. Other types of cancer have not been reported in mice, less in humans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody having a history of thyroid cancer does not disqualify them to use a GLP-1. And I think that's a big misconception and a myth, except medullary thyroid carcinoma. That's pretty much our only absolute contraindication on a GLP-1 is if the patient or a first degree relative mm -hmm. has history of medullary thyroid carcinoma. But why would that be? What's the pathway there? So we don't know, but okay. we don't want to increase the risk of yeah. the patient to develop it, right? Keeping in mind that study was done on mice and not replicated in humans. And again, we have 20 plus year data, mm -hmm. clinical data of GLP-1 medications. Now we have, I don't know if it was done in humans, but maybe you can talk to me about that, that GLP-1s actually show a reduced risk of getting breast cancer, yes. which I think is phenomenal. I'm going to read it here. A cutting edge new study showed that trizepatide, which is the GLP-1 and GIP, the dual drug already held for impressive weight loss, slashes pr breast cancer tumors by 20%. And, you know, it's not a surprise. <laughs> That's huge. 20%. And, and I'm going to tell you why. What's one of the highest risk for breast cancer? It's not, it's not family history. It's obesity. Colon cancer, prostate cancer, thyroid cancer, stomach cancer. The highest risk is obesity. So if you are decreasing obesity, you're going to decrease the risk of cancer. Remember, you're going to have some anti-inflammatory benefits from this drug, right? Mm. So what drives cancer? Inflammation, right? So if your immune system is concentrated in inflammation, you cannot have the proper response for viruses, for cancer cells. But if the inflammation is reduced, then your immune system can work and protect you. Actually, when we talk about inflammation, this is probably where we see all of the GLP-1s and Alzheimer's-related dementia, right? At the seat of all of this, this is the research that I have thrown myself into over the last 10 years. We do see, if you go deep and deep and deep, you see at the root of it really is inflammation as a cascade to all the other different risk factors. And what you're saying here is if we can downregulate inflammation, which is what we're all yes. trying to do, we're all trying to do that, right? We can minimize the risk of getting breast cancer by 20%. Yes. So GLP-1s are neuroprotective. They, they are neuroprotective. They are neuroprotective. Also, it improves insulin sensitivity in, their brain, in the brain, which we know hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistant. It also drives cancer. You mentioned earlier, and I just want to go back to and know if this is the same effect. You said you're seeing in a lot of your... Uh, fertile females that you see that are not really in midlife, that you're getting better conception rates yes. because of GLP-1s. Is that also because uh, obesity and insulin resistance is causing maybe infertility. And infertility? Yeah. PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, is the number one cause of infertility in women, right? Mm. So by improving that with a GLP-1, you improve the chances of conception, right? So that, that you hear of sempic babies is because Many women that thought that conception was not an option for them, that they've tried, now they go on a GLP-1, they start losing weight, no inflammation, they start having a regular cycle, mm. and boom. They're happier. And they end They're up lighter. pregnant. Exactly. They've probably got more muscle mass. They want to have going to the gym. more intercourse, you yes. know, they feel confident, yeah. mental health, um, and that's what happens. So... Dr. Salis well, and I'm going to read something to you very dear to my heart that I posted on Instagram that went quite viral. GLP-1 meds slash dementia risk by 33%. And this was a study published in JAMA Neurology in 2025. They analyzed nearly 100,000 people aged 50 years and older with type 2 diabetes who were on GLP-1 medications and saw a 30% reduction in Alzheimer's disease. That really caught my attention. It really caught my attention and made me so, so happy. Yeah, I mean, it, again, if you know the 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 but the physiology of mm. a GLP one, how they work, it, it it leads to improvement not just in dementia and Alzheimer's, chronic disease. I predict that in the next few generations there will be less type two diabetes, if any, chronic diseases, less cancer. Right. So this is going to be a snowball effect 
in health.